Let's read today's text, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for they shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff of the, on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot, for every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and the cloak rolled in blood will be for the burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for these great truths that we read. When we think of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who came and took on flesh, became a man, it's a wonder, Lord. And Father, as our brother comes and teaches on these truths, I pray that you would help him, undertake for him, empower him by your mighty Holy Spirit, and help us to understand more and more about our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus. For it's in his name we ask. Amen. 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 And while you're being seated, if you would just continue to pray. Ask the Lord to send his spirit to attend to our time, to the preaching of his word and the receiving of it for all of us. That includes me as well. So would you quietly where you're at, just please pray that God would bless the preaching of his word. Father, I do thank you for the prayers of your people. I come before you this morning, Father, seeking to be a servant of Christ and a steward of your mysteries, and that being found faithful by the power of your Spirit. So I join, join with my brothers and sisters this morning, asking that you would send your Spirit, Father, to open our hearts to receive this word. May it not be a common word for us this morning from Isaiah. May it be something that amazes us every time we look at it, every Advent season. We, may we be amazed that you sent your Son, Lord, to be fully God and fully uh, fully God and fully man, Lord, to be as us in flesh and blood, to be the propitiation, Lord, that would satisfy your righteous wrath, your righteous anger for our sins. So we thank you, Father, for what the cross represents. We thank you for this beautiful season, Father. May there be a celebration in all of our homes. May there be a celebration of the greatness of Christ with a great hope of the future, of his second return, his second advent. So I thank you, Father, this morning. I would ask, Father, that you would forgive us our sin this morning, Father, that you would help us in, to re realize that, that it comes through the redemption, the forgiveness of our sins comes through the blood of your Son, that you transferred us from the kingdom and the domain of darkness, from a domain of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So, Father, may that be very clear to us this morning. May we come to you with a clear conscience, prepared to hear your word. May it be fresh and vital in our lives, Father. May we see this in greatness this morning. So please, help us to see the wonderful counselor, almighty God, eternal Father, and the Prince of Peace. May we fix and focus our hearts and minds this morning 
on the greatness of the light that is shown into the world, which you've shown to us in the face of Christ through the gospel. So please, Father, we ask for your blessing upon the time, and thank you for it all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're looking back in the Old Testament again, or we're looking back in the Old Testament for the first time. Last, or two weeks ago, we looked at Luke 1, 26 through 38, the power of God at Advent. The Christmas story as found in the scriptures is a wonderful example for our Christian life as we pursue godliness, personal edification and sanctification. As we look at the humility of Christ, we see him as the example for us. Christ being humble, Christ being a, a humble servant, him being obedient. Remember, I prayed that this morning, that we would be dependent and obedient. God gets the glory when we show that we are dependent upon him for everything, and we seek to obey his word, his law, his commands for us. He has the best for us, amen? Does he not have the best thing for us? And we settle for these things of the world, the things of the counsel of the world. And that's one of the things that we see in the text this morning, because we have to paint the background of this. There's a, a darkness that comes before this light, before this proclamation, this prophecy of Isaiah. There's a darkness on the land. The people are going, man, we're in big trouble. God has removed his blessing. This is like he mentioned in Midian, where Gideon was looking there, and he says, you've taken away your blessing. If you read Judges 6, 7, and 8, you see that Gideon was confused. He's like, you've taken away your blessing. And here he is in Ophrah, and he's actually under the tree, and the angel of the Lord is speaking to him in Judges, and he's just like, but you've taken away your blessing. The blessing has been taken away. He's having a conversation with the angel of the Lord. He's having a conversation with Christ before his incarnation. And this is just a beautiful thing. As I was reading that this morning, just looking at and marveling at that, that meeting, that whole account there, as Isaiah draws that into the picture this morning for us, I'm just like, wow, did Gideon know who he was talking to? Yeah, he did. He knew he was talking to Almighty God. When the angel left him, he went, uh-oh, i just been talking to the angel of the Lord. I should be just crispy, crunchy right now. And so this morning, we're looking at a contrast. If you notice the way this text started out, in verse one, it says, but there will be no more gloom. Do you guys see gloom this morning? Isn't it? Is Humboldt County like depressing or what? But here's the cool thing. This is the exact same thing that Isaiah is painting on the picture. There's this black canvas and he's going to point Christ on it, right? There's this black world around us and Christ shines ever brighter. You people right here who know the truth of the gospel, you shine brightly in a dark place. This is a dark world. This is a dark county. And you, I, one theologian has always told me, light shines brighter in the darkness, does it not? Light shines brightly in Humboldt County because you who know the truth have the beautiful picture of Christ to show that against a black canvas. There's every religion in the world in this county, all over the place, and you have an opportunity to show the greatness of that. So this morning... I don't have any notes for you. I'm sorry, there was some technical difficulties this morning. We won't even go into those because you guys don't even know it, do you? <laughs> that was the cool part, talking to that. You guys don't know how many things went wrong this morning because you don't know, and that's good. And why did I even mention that? I don't know, but just <laughs> shut up, dude. Nobody knew. But let's take a look at this. Look back with me. So if you're in Isaiah 9, turn back to Isaiah 8, starting in verse 19. We need to paint the background. We need to paint the black canvas. And I only do this so that as Christ is being brought forward, you see that on that black canvas. It's a beautiful picture. If you ever go and shop for diamonds or for pearls, they lay out a black piece of velt on the thing. And then they put the diamonds or they put the pearls on it because it shines so magnificently. And you go, wow, I need to buy that for my wife. And then you, anyway, that's another story. Look at verse 19 of uh, Isaiah 8, verse 19. It says, when they, when they say to you, consult. I'm going to stop right there. We're looking for a wonderful counselor. Think of the names that Isaiah has used to explain the child. And yet, look what Ahaz is looking at. Ahaz is the king of Israel at this time. Ahaz is the king who's actually going to be consulting these other, other things. There's idolatry in the land. And John MacArthur is very right where he paints the picture of this idolatry as demonic. The idolatry of the land was demon worship. And I think he paints a good picture of that. He goes to great lengths to paint that picture in this context of the Old Testament, that they were actually worshiping demons. But moving on, it says, consult the mediums and the spirits, the spiritists, who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they not consult their God? But Ahaz is not consulting God. Ahaz is not listening to Isaiah, who says, don't do what you're doing. Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Necromancy. Should they pray to the saints? Should they pray to dead people? As we see in the Catholic church, they pray to the dead people, the dead saints. No, they should not do that. Verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They have no light. They're in the darkness, in the darkness. 
21, they will pass through the land, hard pressed and famished, and it will turn out that they that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Wow. They will not see God in any of this. They will see that this is caused by God and they will curse him to his face. They will curse the skies. 22. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. Wow. That's the picture that this is coming to. That's the picture of the land at the time. This is, this is the rulership of Ahaz, the king. The king has gone out and consulted with other kings to help him. And Isaiah has said, don't do that. Back in, in Isaiah 7, 14, the whole picture of the sign of the virgin that will be bringing the Messiah is based on the fact that Ahaz has already done it. Ahaz has already consulted the other kings to help him. And the is gonna come through and vanquish the land. He's gonna terrorize the land. But Ahaz, in this darkness, has not consulted God. Isaiah is there giving him the, the words of God, giving him the very word of God, and he's ignored it. Wow. How could Ahaz do this? How could he do this? It's amazing to think about it. Some of the things I'd like you just to consider this morning. Some of the things that we don't expect in the text that there's before us this morning. Way back in Genesis 3.15, did we expect what was going to come there in Genesis 3.15, that the serpent was going to strike the heel of the one that was going to be born of, the seed of woman, and he, he had to die to bring the salvation to us. Did we expect that? Did you expect that, that the Savior that was going to come was going to have to do that, that the one that was going to be born of this woman was going to have to do that? No. And we see that in Isaiah 7.14. Turn back with me. Isaiah 7.14. Just flip back. I mentioned it. Let's just take a look at that really quickly. Two weeks ago, we read that as our, our verse to call to worship. Let's look at that one more time this morning. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. El at the end is God. God with us. God is with us. This was in response to Ahaz not asking for the sign. This was Isaiah's response, God's response to Ahaz, that he should ask for a sign, and he was going to be given this sign. And that that sign is based back in 2 Samuel 7, where God had told David that he would never lack a man for his line to sit on the throne of his kingdom. But Ahaz was not trusting God. This Ahaz, the king Ahaz, was not trusting God. He had turned away from God, and he followed after idolatry, and was already making plans to align with the kings in disobedience to God. How does God get glory again? What did I say this morning? Through our what? Our obedience. Right? How many of you are completely obedient today? How many children in the room are obedient? You're all children, by the way, right? Children of God. It's like, uh-oh, he's preaching at me? No, we try, we try, we try. We should, we should strive to obey through faith our Lord and our God. And yes, we do disobey, but here is Ahaz. He's practicing this. Ahaz has gone against the word of God from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is right there giving him the counsel. I mean, the very words of God. And he's like, no, nope, I'm not gonna do it. This is crazy. So there's an assurance also in this text. This morning, did you, how many of you in the text noticed that there was past tense verses in verse three, that it's in the past tense? I just wanna draw your attention to that really quickly before I go through the text for you this morning, but it's in the past tense. So just so you know this, this is a, past tense is a prophetic idiom. It's a saying of the prophet. When the prophet puts things in the past tense, they're gonna happen in the future. What does that mean? It means it's for sure gonna happen. Isn't that cool? He puts things in the past tense. If you look down at verse three, those things are in the past tense as though they've already happened. Isn't that great? That's a beautiful thing for a prophet to do. He puts them in the past tense. And when we read through it, we're like, wait a minute, that's yet future. But he's speaking of it as in the past. Therefore, it's an assurance for the people because remember what they're looking at. They're looking at utter darkness right now. They see no hope. They see the kingdoms coming down on them. They see uh, Assyria, they see these two northern kingdoms coming down upon them, and they're going to be ruined. And yet, Isaiah is going to tell them, this is already done in God's, in God's picture. It's already done. In God's mind, the truth is already there. It's for you. It's beautiful. So let's just work through this. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish for Israel. In earlier times, he treated he treated, God treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Taf Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So this land, Zebulun and Naphtali, where did Jesus start his ministry? Anybody have, a, have an idea? 
Probably right there. <laughs> Why else would the preacher mention it, right? So look with me really quickly. Go to Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew really quickly. Matthew chapter 4. Because Matthew will quote this very thing for us. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Look down at verse 12. We're going to read the 17. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, that John the Baptist had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. Isn't that a beautiful place? Galilee. Something that the... Jewish people didn't even want to go into, but Galilee was where Jesus would be. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Back with Gideon, same thing. He's from the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. When Gideon conquers the Midianites by the hand of God, he's given 32,000 soldiers, and God reduces those 32,000 soldiers down to 300. They're going up against the armies of the world, and yet... God orchestrates that beautiful battle where they turn against themselves. They break their clay pots. They're standing there with their torches. They blow the trumpets. They think they're surrounded. And all of the Midianites turn upon themselves and kill each other. God's victory there. Because that's the same kind of victory we're going to see in Isaiah. But Zebulun and Naphtali, the same regions. The same regions are being moved here. In verse 14, we're still in Matthew 4, verse 14. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Wait a minute. That was back then. Oh, wait a minute. This is now. That was past tense. No, this is future. This is right now. This is Christ in his ministry upon the earth. Look at verse 15. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were setting, sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land uh, and shadow of death, and I just want to stop there, shadow of death. That was a beautiful picture. They're combined together. When you're in the darkness, you're in death. When you follow sin into darkness, when you stay in the darkness of your sin, you're in in death. Those are combined right there. Continue. Upon them a light dawned. Isn't that great? The light of the gospel seen in the face of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, what does it say about the light of the gospel? In the face of Christ, we see the light of the gospel in the face of Christ. When you know the gospel, you've looked into the face of God. You've looked into the face of Christ. That's a beautiful picture that Paul paints for the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Isn't that a beautiful picture? When you understand the gospel, you're looking into the face of Christ. You're looking into the face of your Savior. You're understanding who Christ is as you understand the gospel from the word of God. I find that just amazing. Sorry, am I the only one in the room? Hopefully you all are doing that right now. Verse 17, for that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent. Oh, it comes through repentance. We repent of our sins and we turn to Christ for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He, the king is here. The king is here. When he's walking the earth, the king is here. And he began his kingdom. Yet a kingdom will come. There's still the hope of his second return. But he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, because the king is standing in their midst. So we want to see that beautiful picture again this morning, that the government will rest on him. We've seen how many governments throughout time since Christ left. We've seen the Greeks, we've seen the Romans, we've seen the barbarians, we've seen the Middle Ages too, haven't we? Uh, Some nasty stuff there in church history, right? Then we come to America. Oh, America. A people for the people, of the people. Uh, Somebody quote Abraham Lincoln for me. Uh, By the people, for the people, of the people, right? Except for what's the problem there? The people. We got a lot of bad people, don't we? Don't you guys want a king who's perfect? Don't you want one who will have the government rest upon his shoulders? This is the picture, again, that we see here of our Christ in this, this morning. Let's continue on. Let's look at back into Isaiah 9. Back into Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You guys remember the shepherds? Real quick. I'm going to make you guys turn around a little bit. Look with me at Luke real quick. I can't resist this one. I want to be a shepherd at this time. Don't you want to be a shepherd? Look at Luke chapter 2 real quick. I was not going to read this, but I think I should read it because I think it's a beautiful picture. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20. Can you put you guys yourselves in the position of a shepherd on a mountainside where it's dark? You can't hear anything. Because remember, there's no cities at the time, right? I know a lot of people who want to move out in the country because they just want it quiet and dark all the time. So think about this. You live out 45 minutes off the grid. Your power generator's out. There's no power. It's just quiet and dark. Can anybody of you even imagine that? No, I don't think so. Anyway, my parents can, right? But look at verse 8. In Luke 2, 8, you got to just put yourself in this beautiful, dark, quiet hillside, right? There's some sheep on there, but it says, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And an angel of the Lord, now this is an angel, it's not the angel, it's an an angel of the Lord, suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. They fell down like they were dead. Verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger, in a feeding trough. God will come and be found in a feeding trough. I mean, I kind of like animals, but I don't like shoveling the pens. I don't really like this whole atmosphere, so I'm sorry, I'm not that way. But my Lord and Savior was put in a feeding trough. It had to stink probably, right? In a feeding trough, in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Is he pleased with you this morning? How does that pleasure come? You can please him by having faith in him. We can't please God unless we have faith in him and faith in his son. Verse 15, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. They knew who had spoken to them, angels of the Lord. Verse 16, so they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger in the feeding trough. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart, The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. They did what? The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard. They made testimony of that. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Shepherds on a hillside, interrupted by angels. The glory of God shone all around them. And they they, they responded correctly. They fell on the ground like they were dead, right? Right? But they were like, we've got to go see this thing that God has made known to us. A light has shone upon the world. Christ has made himself known to us. The light of the gospel. Again, I go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, when you see in the word the gospel, you see the light in the glorious face of, the face of Christ. You see the face of Christ in the light of the gospel. So back in verse 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, and you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, when there's victory. He's talking about a victory that's coming, a victory over our sins. How many of you like victories? Anybody like to be on the victory? How many of you guys like to be on the losing team? Why don't you? Come on. I was on the losing team over here. We lost every single game. It was still great. No, it wasn't. The year before that, my junior year, we went to the, the playoffs. That was good. The divided spoil, the understanding that there's a victory. There will be a victory, and we'll be entering into that. Verse 4, for you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of where? Midian. The beautiful picture of Gideon is now brought to their mind. They're like, whoa, God did that. There was 32,000 soldiers. He reduced it down to 300. Gideon's like going, okay, whoa, you know? And it's amazing how the victory happens because no one could say that it was only, it wasn't, the only way it could have happened is God did it. God did, brought the victory for Gideon there and defeated the Midianites. And so that's the picture that we see here. And the rod of the oppressors, the rod of those who are oppressing them, is going to be removed. It's going to be broken. It's going to be taken away. It's going to take time, though. How many years until Christ comes? 600. And then they're going to wait for a conquering king, right, to come in and have his armies. And yet he comes and goes to the cross. Wow. Because there was a bigger price to pay. The wrath of God had to be satisfied. Our sins had to be paid for. There was something bigger in mind, in the mind of God, in the mind of of Isaiah, and the picture that he paints for us here. Look at verse 5. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, for fuel for the fire. It will be turned to ashes. There will be a victory. And then we get to verse 6. This is where we want to draw our attention and our focus this morning is verses 6 and 7. For a child, wait a minute, a child. 
a naturally born human. A human will be the one who will be victory. He'll be all human. He'll be completely man. The child will be born to us and a son will be given to us. Wait a minute. There's two natures here. How many of you have two natures? Anybody in the room have two natures? No. Good. Wes, put your hand down. Anyway, God, man, there's two natures at work here. We only exist as human beings. But this one, a child and a son, this is the clearest text that he's the God man. This is the text that we derive the understanding that Jesus will be the God man. Hebrews 2.14, he had to be made like flesh and blood for us to pay for our sins. He had to be completely God and completely man. Isaiah is clearly telling us this. He's got to be deity in humanity. He's got to be just like us in every way to redeem us from all of our sin, from everything that we don't do, from everything that we do do, and from everything that's just inside of us that nobody knows about. God knows all of that, and he put it on his son. God knew every sin you were going to commit and will commit and did commit and left undone. He knew it all before the foundations of the world, and he laid those upon his son He's going to be a a child given to us and a son, a child born and a son given to us. A beautiful picture there of the God man. And the government will rest on his shoulders. Aren't you glad to see that? The government will rest on his shoulders. Not this government, but the government will rest on his shoulders. He will be faithful. He will be the king of kings and lord of lords. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Let's take those apart for a minute. What does it mean that he's going to be the Wonderful Counselor? Well, didn't Ahaz look for counsel elsewhere? Turn back with verse 19. It says, when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Yes, the wonderful counselor. Here is a wonderful counselor, one who will counsel them rightly. And the understanding of this little piece, these, these, uh, these couplets that are put together, her wonderful counselor, he will give the counsel of God to his people. He will come in the flesh. God will come in the flesh to give that wonderful counsel to mankind. It's like in Jeremiah 23, 25, it says, Behold, the days are coming when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as a king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. That's Jeremiah 23, verse 5. And in Isaiah 53, 11, he says this, By his knowledge, he will justify many. And in other words, the wonderful counselor knows exactly what we need to be saved. This wonderful counselor knows what to proclaim to us, to be saved. You must have faith in Christ. You must repent of your sins and place your faith in Christ, a faith which he gives you to exercise in his son, to understand that he is the God-man. A wonderful counselor will come, and he will be mighty God. Wow, he will be mighty God. Mighty God. He will be a warrior. He will be an almighty God in the flesh. And here Isaiah is giving testimony to the divinity of the Messiah. He will be divine. He's reinforcing that for us. In case we missed that when he said to us, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. In case we missed that, he makes it clear to us, he will be mighty God. He will be deity in humanity. He will be the complete God-man. And the eternal father, wait a minute, I thought he was the son. Doesn't that ever bother anybody in the room besides me? He's the eternal father? Wait a minute, he's supposed to be the son. It just said a son will be given to us, but he's the eternal father too. Some of the Old Testament, the Old Testament understanding was a father was also the king of the nation. So the king was referred to as the father of a nation. So you look to him as a father, one who cared for you, who looked over you. So that could be one of the aspects here that, that Isaiah is trying to draw forward. But he's the heavenly father. He watches over us. He knows what we need at all times. And Christ said to us already, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen who? You've seen the father. Beautiful picture of the Trinity. Beautiful picture of the God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they're all three the same deity. So beautiful picture. Mighty God, eternal Father. He's our eternal Father, and he watches over us like a father. So this is a good father. I mean, how many of you had bad fathers? Don't, don't, don't raise your hand. But here we have a God who's faithful. Here we have a Father who's faithful, who watches over our every need. Isn't that good to understand? That he watches over us because he sent his Son to, to pay for us, to shepherd us in our souls, to shepherd our souls, to be a servant and a shepherd for us. Eternal Father, one who watches over us, and the Prince of Peace, he himself is our peace. Still says that on the sign. If anybody can come up with something better for our kiosk, I'm welcome to it, but he himself is our peace. Ephesians 2.14, he himself is our peace. What did he say to the disciples when he met with them in the upper room? 
peace be with you. He's standing there. He's bringing the very peace that they need with him. In John 14, 27, it says, peace I leave with you. Isn't this beautiful? Peace I leave with you. My peace, my peace give I unto you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Are anybody afraid in the room this morning? I have a little bit of fear. I got in a plane. I'm flying. It's going boom, 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 boom. And over, every time you fly over Denver, does anybody, it's like boom, boom, boom. I'm like, oh, it wasn't too bad this time. Was I afraid? Nah. I'm just like, who's going to preach on Sunday? I don't know if I go down. But Jesus says, peace I leave with you. He's left his peace here. He's left his peace here through the Holy Spirit. He left his spirit to be that comforter for us. Peace I leave with you, my peace give I unto you. Not as the world gives, there's no peace here, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The Prince of Peace. He will bring utter peace to the whole world. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness For then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Who's going to accomplish this? God. God brings peace. God brings this beautiful picture of a government resting on his son's shoulders. God's the one who's going to establish this for all of eternity. The government will rest on him. And peace. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. There's no justice right now. There's no righteous right now. This is a perfect justice, a perfect righteousness. From now on and forevermore, the zeal or the jealousy of the Lord, the zeal or the jealousy of the Lord, he's jealous for his people, he's jealous for his glory, he's jealous for there to be a culmination. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. God will do this. Sometimes we think, well, we have to accomplish certain things to bring about peace. We have to do this, we have to do that. No, God will bring it about. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish these very things for us. I can't turn the page, I'm sorry. So things are going to get worse. In this prophecy, to bring us back into the context of this, things are going to get worse for Israel. 600 years are going to pass. Some 600 years, hundreds of years are going to pass before this prophecy comes to fruition to be fulfilled and for everyone who believes if there's anyone in this room this morning who doesn't believe the truth of who this is and what is being said here oh that you would oh that God would open your hearts and minds this morning to hear the truth of the Christ the one who came to die for our sins the one who came to be the fulfillment of God's prophecy the God man for a child for a child will be born to us and a son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. He'll give us the counsel of God. Mighty God, he will be God in flesh. Eternal Father, he will care for us like a heavenly faithful father. And the Prince of Peace, he will bring to us the beautiful peace. For everyone who believes on this child, there is hope and there is joy. When we run into people who have no hope and no joy, what do we ask them? Do you know Christ? When we run into people and we say, joy, may you be rejoicing. Remember it says rejoice? It's joy. As the season unfolds before us, as we see people with no hope and no joy, and I'm guilty of this myself, I'll tell you that right now, I have some people that I need to just tell about Christ and leave it at that. Because if there's a conflict, it shouldn't be there. If there's any kind of tension, it shouldn't be there. Because I see them as needing this hope and this joy. And I need to tell them about this hope and this joy. So as this Advent season opens up before us, as we see the greatness of the celebration, as you're out singing Christmas carols tonight in McKinleyville at 6.30, I'll plug for that, may it be that they see a hope and joy in you that they hunger and thirst for. How long has it been since somebody's asked you about the hope that resides within you, the hope of Christ? May that be our thrust. May we enjoy this beautiful picture of Christ, the Son of God, the child and the Son, the God-man, Christ, who we must put our faith in, We must come to him by faith and honor that. Repenting of our sins and coming to Christ, that is the only means by which we can come to our heavenly father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father but through him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the picture you paint for us in the Old Testament. We thank you for the picture that you paint in the past tense when Isaiah proclaimed this. 
We now see this as fru- in fruition. We now see this through the New Testament eyes, Lord, that this was about your son and that he has come and that he has fulfilled all of what is in Scripture. Father, may we be bold and courageous to proclaim that in every aspect of life and what we've been given to do here as your ambassadors, as those who sweetly enjoy the greatness of Christ. May it be in our celebrations, Lord, of the Advent season. As we go sing Christmas carols tonight, may people see and hear, Lord, the greatness of our joy, the greatness of our hope. And may they ask, what is that joy? What is that hope that you have? So, Father, please work in and through your people for your glory and for your namesake and to draw those who you are drawing. So we ask for your blessing upon the events of the day and the events of the Advent and the things to come. Father, please keep us mindful. Keep us mindful of these things. So we ask your blessing. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.